I just want to thank a few folks uh, so that I don't forget later on. Uh, my producer, Lily Tyson, pulled this all together. Carmen Baskoff, who's a producer for Where We Live, the amazing daily talk show on WNPR, is here as well. And Carlos Mejia is taking photographs in the back, all of my colleagues from WNPR. Um, if you look on the screen, you'll see uh, our Next logo. Next is a program that I've been hosting for a few years as part of the New England News Collaborative which is an eight station collaborative of stations across New England. And we work together to tell the stories of a changing place. And so our, our, our program not only airs on Connecticut Public Radio, but also on the excellent little radio station WNHH, which you can hear right here in New Haven, which is a product of the New Haven Independent. Next to that, you'll see a logo for the Cities Project, which you might not know anything about. Uh, Bruce Putterman, uh, who is the publisher of the Connecticut Mirror is here. He helped to pull together a really fairly remarkable collaboration of newspapers and other media companies all across the state to tell the stories of our cities in different ways. Uh, a really uh, pertinent uh, series of stories coming out recently from the Waterbury Republican American that have been presented on all of the platforms, including the Connecticut Mirror and uh, WNPR. It was about old brownfield sites and trying to figure out how we clean up places uh, that do need to be remediated before they can be brought back to life. So it's very pertinent as well. So that's what that logo means. You'll be seeing it on different stories coming out in your local newspaper, the Hartford Current, the Hearst Papers, uh, the Connecticut Mirror, and others uh, all throughout the next couple of months. So let's start this conversation. And I'll just say quickly that I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which probably gives you a pretty good idea why I'm fascinated by old industrial spaces. We are, we are littered with them in Pittsburgh, which is, um, which is steel country surrounded by coal country. It's one of the reasons I'm still drawn to, to towns like the one where I live right now. I live in Winstead, Connecticut. Does anybody here know Winstead at all? So it's a it's a little mill town up in the northwest corner. It's uh, sort of permanently stuck in 1955, a year that the, um, that the great flood uh, ravaged the town, knocked out half of Main Street. But what was left standing was uh, a whole series of beautiful mill buildings that, that tower over the Main Street. And they're lovely, but they kind of remind the people there that nothing has been in them for the last uh, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years. What's interesting, though, is in the last couple of years, they're starting to come back. Uh, there's one mill that's been reactivated in the Mad River Lofts, and there's businesses and, and uh, artists in there. Another is the home of the American Mural Project, a fascinating project that is devoted to a huge piece of 3D mural art that is completely dedicated to the idea of work in America. And when it opens, Hopefully later this year, maybe next year, it will be uh, something that will bring people to the little town of Winstead, Connecticut. And there's another mill building that's being reactivated that has a brewery in it that will at least bring me down the hill to it periodically as well. Um, my wife owns a build, uh, uh, she owns a, uh, a yoga studio in one of these buildings. And I have uh, come to know the idea of industrial rebirth as something from not only the standpoint of someone who talks about it on the radio and covers it as a, as a reporter, but also someone who's a small business owner and is engaged with it. So I'm fascinated by this topic, which is why I wanted to bring on the people we have today. Ella Hugh Rubin is an associate professor of urbanism at the Yale School of Architecture, and I want to welcome you to this conversation. And you really helped us think about what this conversation was going to be. So first of all, thank you for that, and thank you for being here. Thank you. It's great to be here. What, why do we care about these old buildings so much, these, these buildings that, that tower across so many of our landscapes? You know, we have to make sure people do care about these buildings. I think actually, unfortunately, in some cases, the buildings are, are just missed or, or ignored, or they're in parts of the city that people don't necessarily go to. Here in New Haven, uh, we have the Mill River District, where so many uh, of these of these really fascinating and wonderful buildings still are, and we need to bring people to those sites, which we did this morning. Uh, and a really great tour, an ideas, uh, Arts and Ideas Festival tour in the pouring rain <laughs> in the Mill River District. I see some of our participants here. This is a hearty group, very impressive. They're still damp. They're still, they we're all soaking wet still, absolutely. Uh, but so we need to cultivate that interest. We can't take it for granted, that's, that's one thing. But, but the other, for so many of us, um, these, these buildings, we connect with these buildings. Uh, they have, um, value to us. They have a kind of age value that can't be replaced. It can't be fabricated. Uh, there is this authenticity to these buildings. 
And that is a, a buzzword and is supposed to be because as we begin to talk about how they change and who desires them today, associating themselves, whoever the new users might be, with that sense of authenticity, drawing it from the building, uh, is something that uh, has, has pushed a lot of adaptive, adaptive reuse. And the third reason why we love them is because they're so well made, we can never replace them, uh, what is built today is not built with the same quality as so many of those buildings, and many of them are so adaptable to so many different uses. That sense of authenticity, while certainly something that draws us to, to these buildings, it also comes at a cost. One of the reasons why mill buildings often lay vacant is because as they deteriorate over time, with each year it becomes more and more expensive to think about how you might remediate that site, how you might clean up the lead paint, how you might fix the roof and the sagging floors. Yes. And so that authenticity comes at a cost and a question that you always have to ask is, is, is that cost worth it? Yeah, yes, it is. Yep. <laughs> it, it, it definitely is, but you're raising a key point is we need to, um, we need to be good stewards of these buildings. Um, and we, we, can't, we can't take that for granted. Uh, I mean, I see you've put up, I'm so glad you're showing this image, the New Haven Gaslight Company building. Uh, credit to this image goes to Chad Herzog, the program director of Arts and Ideas. Um, and we had been talking about industrial buildings from last year. This, this is one of our great gems in the city, in, in, in my opinion. Uh, and this is an ad administration building, an office building for the Gaslight Company. And so it has some elegant touches that other uh, industrial buildings might not have. You can probably see the little keystones uh, on top of the arched windows on one side, and then of course the clock tower itself. Um, and this is the kind of building that's now privately owned. It's owned by the company that, that has all the salt and gravel there. I'm sure you know what the company is, but I can't remember the name right now. On land that had been um, New England, New Haven Gaslight Company um, land, this building had been used at different times. It's disused today. And it's the kind of building where um, we would like to build a constituency that begins to care about the building, begins to become good stewards, even if that means mothballing it, even if that means making the, the smaller or more modest investments up front, even perhaps when we don't know what the use will be. And that's a leap of faith that can be, um, that can be controversial. Well, talk about that, about mothballing a building and saying, this is so historically important, it's so architecturally interesting, right. that we would invest in taking something and just boarding it up until we can do something with it. Yes. Look, space is at a premium in many cities. You have cities like uh, Hartford, New Haven, Bridgeport that are crippled by the fact that so much of the land is used by not-for-profits, meaning they don't have anything on the tax base. How do you convince someone that you take a perfectly good plot of land in a city that wants to grow and say, don't use that just yet? In other words, um don't use it, don't clear it for a new building, but mothball it. Don't clear it. it for a new building, mothball it until we can find something better to do with it. Right. Well, you have to make the case that these buildings are public assets. Uh, they are public assets for a number of different reasons. They're partly an asset because of their age, because of the narratives they evoke, because of the sense of continuity with the past that they present to the city. And that is valuable. Mm -hmm. We developers and real estate people have caught on to this, that the old buildings with this sense of place, with this character is very hard to reproduce. It's very hard to invent. And so there is real value, monetary value to these buildings. And there is a social value. There is a psychological value, the sense of continuity of the past. Um, and it's especially important in New Haven, and this image shows it well, where we've been um, so riven by the urban renewal era highways uh, from the 50s and 60s and, and separated and cut off so many of our neighborhoods. A landmark like this is a beacon to pull you through, to pull you under that underpass, uh, and, to, and to present something unique. 
totally unique. I know you're not supposed to modify unique, but it's 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 that good. Totally, completely <laughs> unique. Exactly. Well, well, and you mentioned this before. In in a case like this, you may have to pull along people, and you may have to convince them that right. this is something that's that's worth doing. As we look at this building, uh, the Winchester Lofts. Yep. This is a factory building that has a story, a very specific story connected with it, and I'm sure many people in the city know what that is. But maybe you can. We can talk about that a little bit. When you have a building that is imbued with history yeah. of this type that doesn't just make it locally significant, but nationally and internationally significant. Yeah, well, that's right. And there are so many narratives that course through this landscape. I mean, historians would, you have to choose what you want to, to draw out as you begin to tell a story. And I think it's important that we allow the heritage of these buildings to be plural. They're not mutually exclusive. The um, folks who are marketing Winchester Lofts that is now partially occupying this space, although one reason why it's so fascinating, as I think a lot of our audience knows, is that it's still half in ruin. Uh, it's a very special uh, uh, sort of fragile moment that it's in right now in redeveloped and, and still in ruin. They want to call forth uh, this kind of heroic imagery of Winchester Arms, um, they want to associate it with the gun that won the West. They want to associate it with the individualism that's so much part of the mythology of, of Western settlement, for example. They want you to be able to, uh, authenticity right there, see, on their marketing materials. I don't know if they're still using this, but when it, they first came out, these were some of their posters. And also, the we're all artisans on the right is interesting, too. We paint, we build, we dance, we live. It is to... Um, to say that you may be a lawyer, which is okay, um, <laughs> or a banker or anything, but you have, and, and listen, it's great to live there. Not, if you live there, that's wonderful. I have nothing against people that, that live there, but just as, as an analyst, just thinking about what they're trying to associate with the building, and you say, you know what, I, I, I think I am an artisan, at least a little bit, and I should live in a loft, and I'm, I'm impressed by the way that this connects to this sort of heroic legacy. But do we also then talk about the labor history of Winchester? The New Haven Labor History Association has done an amazing exhibit on Winchester that calls out the fascinating history um, of its unions and of its strikes and the corporate history. Uh, is that going to sell the loft apartments? Maybe not as much as the Wild West image. So it's political. Heritage is political. That's one of the aspects of this. Heritage is history mobilized for some agenda, and we want to be able to analyze that. But, but, but that, is, that is interesting. You have, you have multiple histories, and so right, right here you have uh, a, a space that has this incredible industrial history. So many generations of people worked there. They yes. want something for their community that's going to be re-energized. The problem is that, A, these lofts will probably be sold to people like, let's just say, lawyers who can afford to live there. Right. And it's going to be sold to them based on the promise that they're part of a history that includes the gun that won the West. Right. And as we heard in our introduction, that, that gun that won the West is one way of saying that it was taken from somebody else. Yes. And, and so how do we grapple with all those things as we're trying to figure out how we preserve this space as a place where people can live and work and thrive? Right. Well, I mean, what I would say to that is we want to, we want to push our tolerance for dissonant heritage. I mean, we want to push our tolerance. We, we don't need the history to be um, boiled down to a, to a slogan or, or to a myth. They become much more interesting when we accept that, that history is, is dissonant, that it's not always harmonious, it's not always uh, happy, and it's more interesting to, to, do, to do so. And you know, the question is, we take the time perhaps to try to draw out these narratives. How do we share it in a meaningful way? Um, and how might it relate to questions to do with equity and affordability that is such a big issue in so many of our neighborhoods in New Haven when you have a building that um, was the place where so many people who came to New Haven in the Great Migration uh, came to have jobs there. Um, will their children, will their grandchildren be able to uh, live in these buildings? What we'd like to be able to say is yes, uh, they, they will be, and that the history of the Great Migration may be as much a part as the Winchester Lofts as, as the gun. 
Mm. I, I want to move uh, to another space that you're very involved in, and I think this is important to talk about in part because the, those, those stories, that history, this is actually a part of the ongoing process for, for Gulf Street. Maybe you can talk about the, the building and what's happening there. Right. Well, you know, uh, uh, many of us, I think, even in this audience, have come to care about this building. It has a fascinating history. I really got um, turned on to it in the last couple of years, uh, working with students on a project to excavate its history, but also to create an interactive history for the building, because people remember this building. Now, it, we've seen the way art space has used it for different events in this epic drill hall, this drill hall that could do anything. Um, and we, we must preserve this building and we must preserve the, the drill hall to be able to have these kinds of events. It's owned by the city. Not all of us think the city is being the best steward of this building. We think that they should invest more money even to mothball it, even to arrest its, its decay. But what's really interesting about the armory is it has a military history, obviously, and it was built for essentially the, the Connecticut National Guard and the second company of the governor's foot guard, mm -hmm. which used to ferry the governor back and forth between New Haven and Hartford when there were two capitals, when New Haven was co-capital. Before the trains. Before the trains. Well, uh, yes, yes, that's right, but before the trains, but, but for a long time after as well. And, and they, they're still around the governor's foot guard. They have got a great band, and they have a great <laughs> marching band. But even from the beginning, they knew this would be a multi-purpose space. They knew that this would be used for dances, for events, um, and uh, for, for antique shows, and very importantly, for the Black Expo. And for many years, this was the site of the Black Expo. Many people remember it happening here. And those memories are important. They're individual memories. They're not the grand historical narrative, um, but they're ways in which we build attachments to these places, because the built environment holds so many of our memories. Uh, and we want to make it, it's, we want it to be our armory, everyone's in that way, that we, we can build these attachments to it. Um, and uh, I, I'm very optimistic about the future of this building because I think that the people of, of New Haven want to imagine its future, see people, see themselves as part of the armory in one form or another, and yet we will continue to have issues of for whom, for whom, really. We made a model, my students did in the School of Architecture, um, which I still have and can show you if you want to see it, uh, of the armory, and the kids took it over, uh, imagining the future of, of this place. And we were glad that the, that the model served that, that kind of purpose to build those kinds of attachments. Mm. I, I want to welcome up Kathy Stanton. She's a senior lecturer of anthropology at Tufts University, and she's the author of The Lowell Experiment, Public History in a Post-Industrial City. We wanted to talk to Kathy because Obviously, we could focus so much of our attention right here in Connecticut cities, uh, right here in New Haven, and not go uh, very far, uh, much further than a few miles away, and really be able to tell a story about industrial heritage. But it extends across New England. And Kathy, first of all, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks, John. And, and then industrial heritage, it, it extends across all of New England, in part because you know we've been making stuff here for a couple hundred years. And that's the story of Lowell, too. It is, and actually it's not just New England, it's really kind of the North Atlantic, and uh, Lowell has been interesting because it's been a model within that whole sort of stretch of Northern Europe, Northern England, the coal belt, the, um, the textile belt, as uh, first of all an early industrial city, and then a city that lost its industry relatively early. Textiles have tended to be sort of early in and early out, um, kind of lost its economic driver, and then turned to culture, was sometimes called culture-led uh, redevelopment or regeneration uh, in the 1960s, 1970s um, as sort of cultural production as a way to replace Replace and rebrand, now we'd say rebrand. Um, we weren't talking about that in the, the early days, but Lowell kind of, um, it didn't invent it, although a lot of people there will tell you that maybe they did, um, in, in the same way that they talk about being the first industrial city in, in the US. Um, but they have been a model and a really important uh, kind of early adopter of this, this set of strategies. When, when you talk about the economic benefit of doing something like this, of, yeah. of really rethinking how an industrial city can come back to life, that's, that's a, key, a key piece of this. Talk about the economics of that, because it's something that I think whenever I have conversations with people about how to re-engage these spaces, they always say, well, how do you make the money work? How do you make the economics of it work? Sure. So um, early on in Lowell, I think people thought if we just we 
biff up the mills and we you know replace the windows and make everything look great and keep the canals clean and tourists will flock and uh, they will spend millions of dollars a year and we'll have hotels downtown and that that was kind of the initial vision that there would be this very direct economic benefit which has never come to pass and fairly quickly the the architects of the new lowell realized that that was not the way you made money out of it and it and, and simultaneously the the people who were planning it from the beginning were also talking about um, and then one of the sort of fathers of the national park there, Lowell National Historical Park, said very explicitly, this is about making Lowell a good address again. And so it really was more about image making, and, and, um, and so I, I talk about you know, kind of Lowell, and especially the role of historians and preservationists in sort of um, framing industry as both interesting and past. Um, and it was interesting, I, I started studying it in the late 1990s when there actually was still uh, little, little bits of textile production around, sort of specialty, um, automotive fabric and things, not, not big mills anymore, but it was still there, but it was, it was past and it, it was already, you know, like, we don't want to talk about that anymore, we want to talk about the glory days of, you know, kind of creating the city and, um, and it was that reframing, it, it's the sort of symbolic reframing of the city and the work of kind of cultural workers within that that has proven to be um, kind of the lost leader that attracts new kinds of industry, new kinds of people, new kinds of investment. Yeah. Mm. Elihu, uh, you, you gave us a, a few slides and a few other examples of places elsewhere mm. in the world that are trying to do this work. And I was wondering if you could take us through a few of these too as we, as we consider Lowell and others. What are we looking at? Well, this is the landscape park in Duisburg Nord in the Ruhr Valley, which is the coal valley of, of Germany, uh, and in some sense a kind of rust belt of, of Germany, they have spent a, a, a it made incredible investments to um, create heritage landscapes in these places, which include museums to coal, um, and in this case, experimenting with something really interesting, which is to say, what if we allowed it to be a ruin and created a park around it? What is our tolerance for these kinds of ruins? What is our interest in it? Um, and uh, I just find that fascinating. Wait, Kathy, uh, yeah. you were going to jump in? Well, it's, it's really interesting. A site like that is so phenomenally expensive and incredibly toxic, usually, and, and rusty, you know, literally these giant blast furnaces and things, that that, um, in some ways, is a more sensible thing to do rather than right. to, to try to preserve them. So how has that played out? How successful is it to have a ruin? Well, I, th I, think, it, I think it has been successful. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know to what degree it's creating a huge amount of, of money through the tourist economy. Yeah. But there is a, a tourism economy there from people in Germany and from people all, all around the world. Mm -hmm. And at least in the discourse of architecture and industrial heritage, this has become um, one of the key case studies. Now, I'm not sure that's really a uh, mark of success, that it's a case study in uh, architectural history classes, um, but, but it is one of them. <laughs> Gasworks Park, I think, has been very successful, which is another example where it is all about remediation. Yeah. Uh, R Richard Hogg, the uh, landscape architect, uh, developed this. You can see the fence. You can't get at all of the stuff. Uh, you can actually get closer in some of the landscape, some of the Ruhr Valley Landscape Park places, but they've allowed this to be a ruin. They've created a new park that looks out across, um, across the, the, the bays of Seattle to, to downtown, and it's become part of the public landscape there. And yet they've also decided they would like in some ways to remember this yeah. in this way. And when you talk about the plural meanings of industrial heritage, one of the interesting meanings to me, and it's not one that's often foregrounded, is Capital leaves, you know, um, economics, right. you know, the, the economic force in capitalist places and economies, they, it moves. It's very, it's volatile. It's what cities are all trying to capture, of course, and, and root in their own cities. And that's, um, it's, it's a very tricky message to get across because very often you get the boosterous me me message about, you know, the city's coming back and it's alive again. But it's, the reality is that there, it's not usually accountable. It's not usually rooted. And so maintaining a message like that is a really sort of ambivalent thing. You're, I totally agree with that, and, and not everyone in the United States is on board because we don't want to think that our great industrial society is in the past. Mm -hmm. This is why we have so many debates around the representation of ruination in Detroit. 
Um, right. And uh, people have called it America's uh, Rome in some sense, but we don't want our great cities to be uh, ruins. When, when someone, uh, the photographer Camilo Jose Vergara mm -hmm. suggested, let's make a ruin park downtown, people said, what are you talking yeah. about? American cities are not ruin parks. Mm -hmm. And so it is tricky, um, and yet I'd, I'd like to test our tolerance for yeah. it. I wouldn't mind having a few more ruins hanging around. Seriously, I was going to say, this it. might be the moment for my refurbishing decline images here. So that, that I'll just tell my uh, improving decline story. So this is when um, the Lowell National Historical Park was created. In the early 90s, they, they made an exhibit that showed the entire history of Lowell, including the current history, which is interesting because it's a history that's not really done. So they had three finishing rooms, and the first one was always called the decline room, which is like Lowell declined, right. the mills left. Um, and then there was a sort of a boosterish Lowell has come back, and then a Lowell Today room. So the decline room, which was initially painted white when they got the mill, they, the National Park Service did a whole lot of research to discover what color the walls had been and how to paint it so it looked moldy and dirty and all of that. But then after a while, the decline room was felt to be outmoded. It was old decline, and we needed new decline. And so, and this was when, when you do this kind of research, sometimes you just luck into the right moment. So the next slide is this next moment. So the, the picture on the left is the two guys removing old decline <laughs> and putting in, getting ready to, to refurbish the decline room because right. we needed new and improved decline, <laughs> which struck me as a particularly American way of thinking about this. That is, you know, even, even our ruins <laughs> have to be kind of new and, and novel. And I think a lot of the cultural work, this is, Kind of the, the, one of the points I took out of it. A lot of the cultural work here is designed to produce novelty. I think it's one of the tricky things and sort of dangerous things for cultural workers and artists and uh, artisan, you know, brewers and, and yoga teachers and all those people who are kind of <laughs> implicated in, in re, um, remaking these spaces that in some ways, and scholars as well, that we're, the work we're doing is creating novelty around these, these old spaces. Yeah. yeah. Well, this is something Elihu and I have talked about a little bit. I'd love your th thoughts first, Kathy, is Part of it is spaces like these, they have a specific resonance to us that I don't think that many of us can put our fingers on, but th there's very few people probably in this room who aren't attracted to um, beautiful aged hardwood floors, high ceilings, large windows, exposed brick. Not every, that is not everyone's aesthetic, but it seems as though across America, that is an aesthetic that resonates with an awful lot of us. And so a question is, a, what is it about that particular aesthetic that draws us to spaces like this to want to preserve them? And secondly, do other spaces that perhaps are in a different era of decline that aren't as attractive to us, they, they suffer from our, our inability to get our brains around what, what beauty might look like yeah. or, or lasting beauty might look like? I think some of this may just be the, the expansiveness of it, the sense of expansiveness, and especially with big factories, with, with big buildings, like that armory, you know, that they're, they're, um, you can sort of feel the, the optimism and the grandeur, and, and, and then also that kind of bittersweetness, and maybe some kind of an acknowledgement that, yeah, these things do pass, you know, they're, they're very complex spaces. Um, and I, th I think a lot of people just sort of like that, yeah. you know, kind of that largeness, that, and, and the spectacular nature, nature of a lot of them. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, some materials age better than others. Um, some materials develop character and patina as they age, and sometimes newer materials don't age as elegantly as as older uh, as older places do. And and I think that's that's one of the reasons. And and yet, as we move through time, just as the preservation movement catches up to modern architecture, we may find that our aesthetic for post-industrial beauty also includes some of the boxy 1960s era buildings on the side of I-91 right on Hamilton Street in New Haven. Um, there may, you have to, very refined aesthetic to be into it, <laughs> but, but, um, at, but maybe we will catch up to it uh, as, at some point as well. But I, I think part of it is, and it's such a simple answer, but it's just the materials. The materials do, do make a difference in some cases. Do, 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 you, do you believe that? I, I would think that it's more about novelty. It really is about producing novelty. Like, here's, here's the next new old thing. 
the next R really, new old honestly, thing. Really, honestly, and and especially in that you know that sort of continual production of a sense of of newness and, and re reinvigoration. But, but it's one of the reasons why I, I love having this conversation here and across New England it, is that here in New England we have this particular um, idea that we have to freeze things in a certain time and then we keep right. them in that time forever. If it's the town green in whatever town you live in mm -hmm. with the white steeple church and the, the buildings that are perfect, we are going to stick it in colonial times or Victorian times and leave it there forever. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess I just wonder from a preservation standpoint, Kathy, how healthy that is to say, this is, this is the moment at which we're gonna fix Lowell or New Haven mm -hmm. and it never shall change. Yeah. And that's, a, um, that's sort of a mainstream notion within preservation, which I think is changing actually, um, in the same way that you know, biologists no longer look at an ecology as sort of a static thing. I think preservationists are coming to really see li these are lived spaces and you know, kind of continual works in progress, although there's still that kind of um, that focus on the, the period of significance, you know, that right. this is why this building is significant. But I think in practice, there's a lot more tolerance for telling multiple stories. Yeah. 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 Do you, yeah. you have a thought on that? Well, yeah, I, I agree. I think that, um, you know, Connecticut's a great place to talk about the colonial revival as one of these movements. And, and the colonial revival did have real reactionary political overtones, uh, many of us believe. And in some places, they are stripping. They're, they're stripping to bring it back to the moment of, of cultural significance. And, and I think that's absolutely right. Preservation today is much more interested in layers and in celebrating those layers. Mm. I, I wanna bring up a few folks who are working on the ground right now in projects that are trying to revive a few of these buildings in very different ways. John Thomas is here, he's Community Engagement Coordinator uh, for Community Solutions North Hartford Partnership, and we're gonna be talking uh, about a very interesting program that he's working on. Also, Nico Wheaton, who's Executive Director of Next Haven, brand new to New Haven and brand new to this project. Um, I'd like to welcome you both up here, and um, I'll let you get settled in. Thanks. Welcome. And we're, we're very happy, Nico, to have you uh, here in New Haven, as a matter of fact. Where, where are you coming to us from? I'm coming from New York City, from Harlem. And what were you working on in Harlem? I was the director of public programs and community engagement at the Studio Museum in Harlem. So, so, so what brings you to New Haven? <laughs> Well, employment, um, <laughs> but also, you know, all of the opportunity that's kind of wrapped up in what Next Haven is. Uh, ironically enough, Titus Kafar, who's the artist who founded this institution, um, he and I met at the Studio Museum when he was an artist in residence uh, back in 2007, and I was a curatorial intern at the time. Um, and so I think, you know, our thought partnership kind of began then in terms of thinking about how artists um, can become central to processes of kind of yeah, just creative problem solving for the issues that our cities are facing. So, so what's the problem that's trying to be solved here? To tell us about the, first of all, the space, since we've been talking about spaces a lot, the yeah. space that Next Haven is, is, is in. Yeah, so um, you can see up there, we have the two kind of former manufacturing plants. This is 169 Henry Street. Um, and so these buildings themselves have had, you know, a couple of different lives and uses over the years. Um, at one point, they were manufacturing beakers uh, that were mm -hmm. kind of sold to, to Yale labs mm -hmm. to do kind of scientific work. There's ice creamery. Um, and so you'll see in the center, that's kind of the contemporary space um, that our architect, Deborah Burke, is kind of building to bridge uh, through this kind of adaptive reuse practice, um, these two uh, factory plants. And so... Yeah, at the moment, the part on the right is what's currently open um, for people to come and visit. We have artists in residence that are there. They've been there since January, and we're looking to launch the full facility in the fall. And, and what's in the facility? When it, when it is a full facility, what, what's happening at Next Haven? Yeah, well, so I'm working on the tagline as we speak, um, but I- Can we workshop it here? <laughs> we can workshop it here. we got a whole here. bunch of smart people. Yeah, yeah, I mean, so Arts Incubator comes to mind, I think, when we think about all the activity that's gonna take place in this building, you know, there's emerging artists that are in residence there for a year. They're also working with James Hill House High School. So they'll have an apprentice in the studio, kind of learning some of the practices and processes of becoming a professional artist. And then that kind of bit that you see up on the left that's above um, with the kind of terrace is where we'll have an established artist in residence that's living. And so when you think about mentorship and kind of the lack of mentorship in the arts, <laughs> um, really trying to create kind of a tiered approach um, and an intergenerational approach to supporting artists at every kind of aspect and point of their career. What have you been hearing, and I know that you're, you're new to New Haven, but what yeah. have you been hearing from people in the city, people in the community about this project, what, what they want to bring to it, what they maybe expect from it? Yeah, 
I guess it depends where the conversation takes place. So if I'm standing right outside the building and people see the kind of construction fence and the trucks going in and out, um, it's mostly people from the neighborhood that have questions about when it opens, if they can come in, what's going on. And so, you know, the founders and myself, our approach has always been, we'll come in and check it out and we'll talk to you about it inside. Um, and, you know, I think as I kind of meet more folks, I've been here for about like three and a half minutes. So, <laughs> um, you know, at the deli, P&M, Nika's, um, you know, when people find out that I'm associated with the project, you know, it's either, wow, rough neighborhood, but exciting project mm -hmm. or interesting project. Why, why would you build and develop that in Dixwell? Um, and so, you know, I think there's many answers to that question, but I think, you know, thinking about, again, investment. Um, and cultural assets and kind of how history plays its life through these buildings um, and the kind of legacy of black entrepreneurship in Dixwell is amazing. That's how I arrive here from Harlem. And, and what are the, those are some of the, the questions you get or the answers you get. What are some of the pushbacks you found to, to a project like this? Are, are there people who say that this, this isn't going to work or here's why this isn't the best use for the space? Yeah, I mean, I think I think there's pushback anytime there's like significant investment involved, right? And so we are a, a really well-funded project at this point, and I think um, you know there can be some frustration because it seems as though people are funding an idea as opposed to kind of a proven concept. And I think that you know, for me, what's really exciting is the kind of way we've been able to stick to the mission that we set out with in 2015 around kind of centering artists um, as these really important voices in the community that can talk to us about the value of our community, right? And the kind of gatekeepers of some of this history. Um, and also finding new and creative ways to kind of share that story. And so, yeah, there hasn't, there hasn't been much pushback, but I welcome it. Um, my email is nico at nexthaven.com. Uh, I'm serious, I, I would love to engage in those conversations because I think that, you know, we're a very young and new organization in a, a city with a really rich history. And so, yeah, I think we have a lot to learn and we're open to it. Kathy, can you talk about the, the Lowell experience when it comes to that, the, um, the community buy-in to the mm -hmm. type of, of historical renovations, all of the work that's been done there over the years? What, what, what have people said along the way? How much have people said, you know what, this isn't going to work? Lowell's a really interesting example for that because there were a lot of that, that sort of naysaying at the beginning, particularly because Lowell was a very, it was a very bottomed out, you know, very, very depressed city and sort of despairing about its past and didn't seem like it was ever going to turn around. And so people like literally laughed at the idea that the tourists would come to Lowell and enjoy industrial history. Um, and what happened was actually an amazing um, sort of social, educational, political process of l almost literally muscling everybody to the table. Not everybody, I will say the community activists who were on board early on left the table. Um, and it was mostly, it was the business community, it was, you know, the local newspaper, um, the local politicians, and there's a very sort of tight political machine um, that worked really well. And, and all of that just really kind of got behind this idea. And it was basically when the business community came on, on board. So, and that actually has been one of my critiques of Lowell, which is that it lost that um, that grassroots community feel fairly fairly early on, although it has sort of, the way that it kept that is um, through a, a focus on ethnic and immigrant and working class history. And this is, this is kind of in countering your idea, Elihu, that there's not room for kind of the, the stories of working people. And in Lowell, it's all about the stories of working people that absolutely foregrounded that. And that was the deal that they made, it was sort of the deal that the, the, the powerful um, voices in the city made with the very strong um, sort of ethnic, um, kind of white, white ethnic groups, basically, Polish, um, um, French Canadian, um, that, 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 that was, um, that, that their stories would be told in the mills, but that that was how they got that buy-in. So there was a lot of sort of buy-in, but it really um, mapped directly onto the kind of the power politics that were existing in the city, and it didn't include people who were more on the margins, um, who had been there for the early discussions when this seemed like just some wild and crazy idea, but by the time it started to seem like a real thing that might attract investment, those people had left. Hey, Elihu, you're, you're obviously very involved in many layers in, in the city. I'm, I'm wondering your thoughts about this project, and, and as Nico was talking about, some of the, the questions people have, a, a well-funded project, and the first question is why? Why here? Why do this now with this building? I mean, I, what Nico said is right. I mean, I think it's inevitable when you see this kind of investment and, and care to have a certain amount of, of pushback, but it shouldn't, it shouldn't discourage people. I mean, this, these were, it's not like, 
It's not like this is being, uh, on, being built on land that's been claimed by the city and turned over, for example. This is a very well-organized well um, well organized effort. And uh, I'm, I support it. I, I hope that it's very successful. Um, and, and yet, as Nico says, the pushback is, is good. I mean, it seems like it's a place that's going to bring people in and embrace that and, uh, and in, ingratiate themselves in, in different ways. And I think, I think that's key. I, I want to turn now to, to John Thomas, and, and I had a, a really uh, interesting uh, day uh, with John and some of his colleagues a couple of years ago when I started my show next. We went with a, a film crew, and we, we went inside the Swift factory in the north end of Hartford. And, and I'm wondering first, John, if you can talk about the, the history of the building uh, where this project that you're, that you're working on is happening. Yes. So. Uh the history of the building is uh, rooted in the narrative of Matthew S Swift, who was a goldsmith in Hartford in the mid-1800s. And in the late 18, 1800s, uh, Mr. Swift left Gold Street in Hartford, where all of the goldsmiths operated, and came to North Hartford and established a business in, in his home on the site of uh, where the Swift factory stands now. So. Uh, the site itself represents the industrial history, architectural history of America from you know the late 1800s all the way up to 1948. They kept adding uh, additions as they expanded. And as you as you take a look at this um, this picture, this is a, a rendering of what it will look like when when it's finished. But if you can imagine the um, the area around it, the houses uh, that surround it with the trees. This is a neighborhood which, uh, over the course of the last you know, 125 years, moved from being a neighborhood that was filled with uh, immigrants from, from Europe uh, to being a predominantly African-American neighborhood. And the story of this factory, I think, is fascinating, John. It's something that I, that, that I learned when I started talking to you about this, and it's, it was a different history than I would have expected. because. In many cases, when there is a, an industrial facility that has been closed for a long time, the story is, is that when you reclaim it and do something good with it, put in anything from artist studios to lofts, you're, you're re-energizing it, and the people around that building will, will be re-energized for the first time since it closed. But that's not exactly the history here, at least for the African-American community around it. Can you explain a little bit about the 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 relationship that the Swift factory had with the people who were living right next to it? Yes, so um, for a couple of generations, uh, you had people working in the factory, and because it was a, a gold leaf operation, the windows, you, you couldn't see through the windows, so they were obscured, and uh, so I used to live right across the street in that yellow house to the right, in my aunt's house there, and we just could not imagine what was going on inside that building. Yeah. Uh, everything from, <laughs> we just could, we were just wild imagination about what's going you on. You tell in some that stories, building. I'm sure, like, yes. what goes on in there? Yeah. And, and, you know, it's not that African Americans didn't have access to jobs there, you know, in the mid 60s during the great, you know, the late migration from the South, uh, late part of the great migration. African Americans were getting jobs there. Um, we've interviewed quite a few people who worked there, but in the you know mid '80s to 2005, when it closed, um, no one from the community was working in that in that factory. So there wasn't a connection to the economic engine of of that factory uh, amongst residents in the community, and so there was a dis, uh, dislocation. Uh, from the factory's narrative to that of the neighborhood, and Elihu, that's that's it is a different narrative, right? It's not the, it's not the story of people walking by the building where they used to work or their grandfather used to work, but but as John has said to me, it's a, it's a narrative of people walking by the building, just kind of looking at it, going, look at this thing, right? You know, it's it's in the middle of my, I I don't have any connection with it, but yet here it is as an eyesore right across from my my house. Which is why the work John's doing is so important, is to begin to knit those ties back together mm -hmm. uh, with the proximate, with the nearby uh, community. 
And at the same time, I, uh, perhaps, you know, the building will be meaningful to people outside of it too. I think this is another tension. Uh, the people around these buildings have a real interest in it. The people around these buildings um, are also uh, people that have been affected in ways which we may not fully understand by the kind of uh, environmental degradation that happens at industrial sites. So there's environmental justice issues in the remaking of a lot of these, a lot of these buildings and, and places. And you need to knit with what's nearby, and yet there, there's no reason, or John, maybe you can tell us, I mean, this building will be a draw for Hartford, for the region, for, for many of us, perhaps. But um, beginning with the neighborhood, yeah. so uh, the, the whole, you know, I work for Community Solutions. We work to end homelessness and the conditions that lead to it. So we have a real estate portfolio around the country, mm -hmm. which really uh, provides housing for uh, veterans um, and homeless people, or homeless veterans. But this piece of work here, you know, we've had CDCs in the, in the uh, community for 30 years that mm -hmm. did nothing but housing. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it would have been a very easy lift for us to put lofts in that building. Right. And, uh, but what we did was go out immediately, and that's when I came on the team. We went out and asked five questions to the mm -hmm. residents, and we de developed a matrix of uses mm -hmm. from that information they gave us, and we committed to doing an economic development project. Uh, that took eight years to put a capital deck together for because not too many people will want to invest in a neighborhood like that. And, mm -hmm. and so what does that investment turn into? What's, what's going to go in there when it opens up uh, next year? So if you look at the left end of the building, approximately one-third of the 60,000 square feet of uh, building there, Bears Barbecue, a great social enterprise uh, <laughs> that, you know, they're going to go in that end of the building and put their commissary kitchen in there. The center of the building will be a 4,500 square foot uh, uh, food business incubator space. So there'll be a shared kitchen and ten, nine uh, private kitchens in there for uh, caterers and food operators. And we're currently working on tenanting the, uh, the right end of the building. If you turn the corner there in the, in the front, that skinny part of the building that's uh, probably around 19 13, around that time, that's going to be a shared office space, co-working space. Mm -hmm. And the white building, we want to put a arts and culture center there. And there's another gray building there that we want to put uh, some type of uh, health services. Mm -hmm. so, so how dependent uh, is this entire project on all of those things happening? Right, we, we saw Winchester Arms before where you have a giant building, some of it's still in decay, but some of it is now being rented out for, for uh, you know, uh, nice lofts. Maybe the rest of it gets built up later. How do you work around the fact that you don't have all this <laughs> space filled up yet? Well, I mean, we're three quarters away uh, through core and shell construction, so we have some time to put this together. Um, there'll be, from October to March, we'll be doing the fit out of the building. Um, I've been transformed from a uh, community engagement person to a <laughs> leasing agent now <laughs> with no training. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we're giving it a good go all the way from our president, Roseanne Haggerty, to, uh, you know, Dave Foster, who's our real estate manager. We're, we're all on, uh, Patrick McKenna, my colleague, we're all on board uh, really going at it to get this, this place tenanted up. Uh, we're having some really good success initially with the food uh, business incubator spaces, a lot of interest. Um, the shared office space, it, you know, what I plan to do is, you know, we, I just don't want white people uh, coming into the office and taking up those spaces, so I'm strategizing a uh, outreach with uh, African-American entrepreneurs and Latin, Latinx entrepreneurs to provide the types of examples of success the residents in the community mm -hmm. need. Mm. Hey, Nico, t talk about how, how you've engaged with, with the community and um, how exactly you're thinking about Next Haven being something that is of the community that is for people of color in New Haven as well as all people in New Haven. Yeah. 
Well, I think as you were talking and answering that last question, I was my mind was just you know running, and I'm thinking about the ways that we are also kind of trying to roll out the building in phases, right? So really trying to be deliberate about establishing the best program or part of the program that we can before we kind of activate the building as it kind of, you know, construction has been a long process as it always is. Um, and so I think that invites people into the process in a way that feels important, right? When there's kind of additions that are digestible and people are able to kind of buy in and understand like, oh, okay, so that's where the community run cafe is gonna be. Okay, so that's where I can bring my aunt to watch a movie on Sunday nights, and that's free? Oh, great. You know, and I think it, it's easier than hitting people over the head with, you know, a really heavy mission, um, a kind of oversaturated program in those kind of early years of development. Um, and so that's the approach that we've been taking, and I, I think this idea of a co-working space and really trying to invite young, or not young, just entrepreneurs in, um, and to really kind of value that the creation of ideas as important um, to the space as well. And so... Yeah, I'm starting to see a lot of synergies between these projects. But but what's so interesting, John, though, is, is that as you as you talk about um, working to do that, the the truth for people who know the North End of Hartford, right? There's not a whole lot of examples of these opportunities in in the city, or certainly in that neighborhood in the city. Um, how how are folks reacting to that? Because you're literally trying to fill a, a market niche with something that's not really happened in that part of town, at least for a very long time. So my approach is to, and um, Nico, you know, it really is about millennials and, and tra because they're the ones getting a lot of entrepreneurial traction in the city. So uh, really kind of like connecting them to the, um, the, the history of black success in the neighborhood. Um, it, you know, people talk about white flight a lot uh, when, when talking about urban sprawl, but people don't talk a lot about black flight. And a lot of people became successful when they got better opportunities and were able to move to the suburbs around 74, 75, which left a vacuum in the neighborhood of examples of black success. And what replaced that was pretty much an illicit trade and what resulted from that trade. So engaging millennials with this history that existed that, you know, it's up to us to uh, organize, strategize, and create those examples so that we drive an impact. And I think that has been very powerful. Um, my, my byline in, in the neighborhood is I don't engage victims. Mm -hmm. So victims can't express power. And we've always been good at, at being successful, creating opportunities for ourselves. So let's lead the charge to do that here at SWIFT. One of the things, LQ, that, that we started talking about is, is a powerful story and the, the idea of a, of a place like this in which, you know, the neighborhood behind a fence couldn't see through a blackened out window because they were dealing with this incredibly precious substance right. that was just a couple yards away, but they could never touch or feel. This is a really powerful story, and I guess I, I'm wondering how you think that plays into not just this project, but others like it, how the narrative of the place gets woven into the way we think about how it comes back to life. Yeah, I, that's, that's a great question, because it does get to some of the, you know, the techniques of public history the techniques of, of bringing these narratives into the public realm and, uh, and doing it, I think, in exactly the, the kinds of ways that John is, is talking about, acknowledging um, that there's certain elements of the swift history that is maybe sort of more official history, and then there may be other aspects of this that should also be woven through. And, and also not to seal it, not to seal history. A lot of the plaques and things, you know, they seem so definite and there they are, and the plaques become historical in and of themselves. It's nice to think about ways in which that, those narratives are, are open and not closed in some of these techniques of public history. And can I, can I just add uh, something? Because, uh, you know, it's all about principles bef before personalities. Mm -hmm. So I'm not exclusively focused on African-American entrepreneurship coming to that building. We have people at different levels of our organization who are reaching out to traditional entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. But it's all about creating that diverse mix to create the energy. And it's based upon entrepreneurship. So those are the principles. Mm -hmm. uh, you have people who are already in shared office spaces that are not as premium 
as the space we're creating there. So it's a traditional approach, hey, you don't like your space? We got space over here at Swift. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, putting people in a space that, you know, in, uh, that didn't exist with dynamics that didn't exist, I think uh, really is, uh, th this is what this is all about. Well, we're really taking a huge chance. Uh, it has not been done uh, before, but um, there's a mix of traditional approaches and this narrative approach mm -hmm. to kind of create that. Yeah, and it seems like you're you're doing it with a really savvy use of the narrative. Like there is there's the draw and the history of entrepreneurship. Like that's a that's sort of a magnet that will will bring a variety of people because you need a range of people right to to make this work. But you're also doing it, and I think this is where um, you know kind of bearing in mind not just the histories of kind of redlining and and people moving out, but also the histories of gentrification. Like we we have enough of a track record now, and when we see that these kinds of places get redeveloped, that they've that's the end that usually happens so that you're, you're doing that with an eye, you, you've got your eyes open about that and that seems to be a, a really interesting kind of use of that continuous history that goes right up to the present. Yeah. And that, that, has, that has been my biggest obstacle since I came here because mm. I've lived in this neighborhood all my life and uh, I have a really strong presence in the neighborhood and people are asking me, why are you working with those white people to gentrify this neighborhood? Mm. And then when I learned about the different forms of gentrification, you know, and, and the model that I have on the project is this is development without displacement. And look around. Don't you think the neighborhood could use a bit of gentrification? <laughs> you know, yeah. just not moving us all out of here. We're also working on housing stability also with the uh, de development of a community land trust in the neighborhood yeah. <clears throat> to acquire properties and provide affordable quality housing in the neighborhood. That, that is an interesting question though, yours. I, I don't know, Nico, if you have thoughts about that. I mean, the, that question that John asked, you know, couldn't the place use a little gentrification? That's a, that's a, that's a sort of a, that's a loaded, that's a loaded <laughs> question in a lot of cities in America. I'm wondering your thoughts about that. Having come from Harlem, not that there's any gentrification there. <laughs> I mean, Jesus, I mean, yeah. Well, so, I mean, it, this could be like a whole other panel discussion, just talking about the role that art and artists play in mm -hmm. the conversation around, well, not the, the practices of gentrification. Um, but again, I think it's instead of kind of laying art and creativity atop a development project, really centering art and artists in the kind of ideation behind what you're doing feels like the antithesis of gentrification to me. Um, and so I think that, you know, I try every time I go to speak somewhere to bring an artist with me because I think that they have really valuable opinions and perspectives on how to think about you know these same issues and so I think yeah it's it's a huge question I don't even know where to start yeah and, and I know something that, that you work on a lot Kathy and we were thinking about we were talking about before the the program is uh, if if art is in some ways linked with uh, gentrification of old industrial spaces and old abandoned buildings uh, food and agriculture is as well. This is another big key, and mm -hmm. part of what John's doing here is is turning this into a place where people are going to be making food. But food is is definitely connected with a lot of these spaces. Yeah, no, I think it's really exciting that those are the two the two things that I see as most hopeful is the role of artists, the presence of artists, and the the kind of critical. Um, analytical kind of view that, that artists and empathetic kind of view that artists can bring, but but also the um, you know kind of the, the food economy. And I was, I was just thinking, looking at these spaces, that so much of these kinds of factories is the history of things getting big, right? It's, it's you know it's kind of growing and growing and growing, and really a lot of the work that's being done now is is trying to rescale it, bring it bring it back down, you know, kind of make it into sort of mi micro units again, which is much more um, sort of hopeful and, and community-based, I think, and those are two realms where that, that can really happen. Well, and, and to what Kathy just said, though, Elihu, we wouldn't build this today. Like, I don't think that we would build a building if we were looking to build a commissary kitchen or loft apartments or, or an artist space. We wouldn't build this exact building today, but we're grappling with the fact that 120 or 150 years ago, this is exactly what we built. Right. Right, and I mean, this one of the things that makes the project so interesting, as John's been uh, describing, it is it's it's an expensive project, um, but it's it's worth it. Uh, you know, one of the things that we talk about, you know, with the whole rise of green building, I think this building must be a lead platinum building of some kind, but that the greenest building is the building that's already there. Um, the embodied energy that is in those buildings. Um, it, it makes it, it it makes it a good bet in terms of sustainability in that way. But the 
the link in terms of continuity, the continuity in the neighborhood. And in a way, if it was mysterious or off-putting for some point in time, now it has an opportunity to redeem itself. This building's life goes on and redeems itself in this way. And that's, that's a great story. I, and, and, and I've heard you say this before, the, the idea of the green building is, is the building that's already there, but I mean, as you look at the economics of it, the reality of it, you take a building like this, you are mitigating lead paint and PCBs, chemicals that have been poured into the, into the rivers and streams, the groundwater, the floorboards for years and years and years. Then you have the fact that you, know, you spend, I don't know how many millions of dollars, John, but like to new windows and new, so that you're not <laughs> leaking Right. Uh, energy constantly, it's, it comes at quite a price yeah. to make this green building green again. Yeah. Well, and that's, you know, our modern world has come at that price. And I, I think right. it's one of the most interesting things about this to me is that as we're, you know, sort of thinking about the changing climate and the role of industrial capitalism and, in, you know, pumping all the fossil fuels and greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, like we're, we're, try, we're struggling to come to terms with the legacy of that. And that on some level we need to do it by taking greater care, all along the you know the, the, the everything from the buildings to the people who live in the, the neighborhoods to thinking about how we make a living and how we grow our food and it's and it's a daunting huge task but yeah. it's like these are spaces where we can engage that conversation. And you know a huge part of the heritage is toxic heritage. I mean, these are where the environmental justice issues come back in. The people nearest by are affected the most. The people on Prospect Hill are affected the least. And that's why, you know, topography and the location of the structures have to do so much with how our, our cities are, are organized. It is the legacy of the industrial city. It's, it's everywhere. We, we have poisoned ourselves in all of these environments. Um, and so the investments being made to remediate, especially when you're in a dense area with housing stock nearby, Th those are huge investments. You know, talking about brownfield sites, even small investments in small brownfield sites are worth it um, when they're in the middle of, of neighborhoods and especially uh, neighborhoods that, that don't have or receive as many resources as, as others. Taking an old gas, an empty gas mm -hmm. station site and spending the money to remediate that one site, there are huge positive impacts to, to, um, to doing that, uh, including being able to reimagine that space, but also in terms of, of public health. And um, I'd just like to point out, we were very lucky that when the Swifts turned the building over, they had to remediate 90% right. of that stuff in order to, to do it. So it was, it was a light lift for us as far as remediation is concerned. That was the initial part of our construction phase. But I also point out, if you look around the factory, all of those Habitat for Humanity houses mm -hmm. and the houses uh, to the left or the forefront of the picture, those are older housing stock. That was like, I, I thought the gentrification question was gonna be the big you know, opposition in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. People were coming up to me saying, I heard there's asbestos in that dust coming off of the ground. I mean, they're very astute on these issues and very, you know, and so it became a touch point of engagement for me. And you know, I don't just bring up the gentrification. It's kind of a loaded question, but I have the answers and we create the engagement and, and I educate people about what it is uh, we do there. We did a lot of pre-development work also in the neighborhood uh, mm -hmm. on health outcomes, um, um, public safety. Um, and the biggest thing that we're bringing now is jobs. So we, you know, the, the narratives, you know, not only do we, 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 uh, uh, we adopted the city of Hartford's um, hiring requirements, even though very little money from the city is in this project. <laughs> And we have maintained 30% Hartford residents, 20% minority and women, and 15% minority business utilization. Mm -hmm. But I've, through my engagement, I've also been able to drive 10% of neighborhood uh, residents who are on this job. So that, once that project began, the engagement was much more effective and the, narr the knitting of that narrative right. was much more deep. Yeah. Uh, John Thomas, Nico Whedon, Kathy Stanton, Ella Hugh Rubin, thank you all so much for the great conversation. I really appreciate it. <laughs>